All right, ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to Rakuten Technology Conference 2015. The session is Building Smart Application with an Algorithm Marketplace by Daryl Arnold and Dego Oppenheimer. Dego being the CEO of Algorithmia and Daniel is an entrepreneur in Dextra. He's here with us now, so please welcome them. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much for having me today. My name is Diego Oppenheimer. I'm the CEO of Algorithmia. Uh, it's a true honor to be invited to speak to you today here at Rakuten, so I thank you very much for, for, for having me. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the importance of algorithms, uh, building smart applications, um, and what Algorithmia is and kind of what it can do for you as developers. So, whoops, as soon as the screen comes up. So a little bit about myself. Um, so I've spent about 10 plus years building business intelligence and big data tools. Uh, I led uh, advanced data analysis tools uh, at, at development at Microsoft, uh, where some of the features that I built out reached about a billion users. Um, so I worked on Excel, uh, SQL Server, and uh, if any of you are familiar with Power Pivot and Power BI, I was one of the first engineers on that, on that team. Um, so previously, I would founded an algorithmic trading startup. Uh, in the finance space, and sometimes I do mentoring for tech stars as well as Startup Weekend uh, back in Seattle. And I got my undergraduate and graduate uh, school was done at Carnegie Mellon University where I specialized in big data and data analysis. So if anybody wants to reach me, my email or by Twitter, feel free. So what's the mission of Algorithmia? It really is to make state-of-the-art algorithms accessible and discoverable by everyone. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what accessible and discoverable it really means as I go through this uh, uh, presentation. But first of all, I want to kind of talk about what really is the importance of algorithms and why algorithms. Like, why do we care? Why should you care uh, about uh, the world of algorithms and what they have to offer? So I really like this quote, um, mostly because it's very self-serving, but uh, it actually uh, you know, kind of explains this really, really well, which is data is inherently dumb. Uh, it doesn't actually do anything unless you know how to use it, how to act with it. Algorithms are where the real value lies. Algorithms define action. Dynamic algorithms are the core of new customer interactions. And there really is, you know, there's been a lot of talk about this algorithm economy. And so the next digital gold rush will be focused on how you do something with that data. And so to kind of synthesize this down to like really like the core is like we've spent about the last five years in this big data craze where we've spent millions upon millions of dollars of accumulating as much data as possible. We have stored it uh, without really understanding what we were going to do with it and we're finally getting to the point where now we want to start taking action on all that data and these data stores that we've been accumulating over the last couple of years. So let's put the whole, sorry, let's put the in perspective really when we talk about like the amount of data that's being created. So in 2009, humankind was creating about 0.8 zettabytes of data. And for those of you who don't know what a zettabyte is, it's 12 zeros behind the one. Uh, so it's very, very, very large. <laughs> By 2020, we'll actually be creating 35 zettabytes a year. By 2020, we will be activating 1 million new devices per hour. And so to put that in perspective of really like, you know, something that we can kind of wrap our head around because these numbers are so big, is like we generate about 2.9 million emails every second. So right there, that was 2.9 million emails generated. 20 hours of video are uploaded per minute today. And 50 million tweets are generated per day. And all of this is information that we need to be able to understand, classify, and take action on so that we can make our businesses more successful. So photos, video, social media content, this is the rise of unstructured data. 
new storage systems were required. This is where the birth of Hadoop came in. This is where the birth of a lot of the new different types of data stores have come in. Uh, so, but more importantly, now we need new ways of analyzing this data. Unst but, and really, to get down to this point, unstructured data is how human, humans process the world. Me and you today are here, every input that we get from our vision, you listening to me through your ears, are, is unstructured data that your brain is processing. And so really what we're getting to is a world where the amount of data that's being generated and what machines need to understand is getting close to how humans interpret the world around us. So again, why algorithms? So this is too much data to process manually. Machines are way better than humans at recognizing patterns. Combining pattern recognition with computational learning theory is how we've gotten to machine learning. And why this kind of rebirth of machine learning or neural net or deep learning in some cases has come out now, even though the technology was invented in the 80s, is that the computing has gotten so cheap that now we can do it easily. So if we think about in the 1990s what it cost to be connected to the internet, it was about $10,000 per month. Storage costs about $1,000 a gigabyte. Today, you know, and I have this kind of outdated slide, we're really talking about 10 cents a gigabyte in terms of connectivity. Storage is 12 cents a gigabyte. And servers cost 20 cents an hour. Just wrapping our heads around, we can pay farms upon farms of servers are at the uh, touch of any developer in here for dollars. You can have like massive computing. And so this really allows for being able to kind of explore new spaces. So again, in the 1990s, it was all about high performance computing and mainframes, and the users were researchers, uh, hardware engineers, large committees. You would have to decide what you were gonna do. You'd come in with punch cards, and you better not get it wrong, right? You had to prepare all of this thing, and then you were gonna go to your mainframe, and you are gonna process, and if you got one mistake, it's all over again, and this took weeks. And so today, now this is kind of completely, like everything is live. We have unlimited computing power to kind of move forward. And this idea of everything as a service has started popping up. So generalist big data as a service, so like Amazon Elastic MapReduce, or real-time processing as a service, such as Amazon's Kinesis. Um, hosted machine learning, like Big ML and Datto. And finally, why I'm talking to you today, algorithms as a service, which provided by Algorithmia. So the low cost of computing, plus massive amounts of data has driven the machines to be able to learn in minutes and hours versus weeks and years. And that's really the big difference here. It's not that the algorithms have that much change, but it's that the amount of computing power that you have available to you allows you to do this process over and over again quickly. And so now computers, can, we can teach them how to do things that we would have never been able to do before. So algorithms and why they're important is how machines learn. And that's the part that, that really uh, is important and the takeaway here. So now that we understand why algorithms are important, let me tell you a little bit about algorithmia. So now that we understand how important algorithms are, and these algorithms already live inside organizations such as Rakuten, they live in universities, they live in research centers across the world. Uh, but building and finding algorithms is extremely hard. Uh, Finding the right algorithm that fits your data has been really hard in the past. Once you find an algorithm that fits your data properly, making sure it scales, that you can deploy it, and then the rest of your organization can use it, is a second level where it becomes really, really hard. And finally, there's no such thing as an I'm getting lucky button for testing an algorithm against a data set. What it really requires is testing multiple algorithms over and over again to see which one has the best fit. And that rapid prototyping it's just not possible with current tools. You have to go download the different libraries. You have to manage all these different dependencies. Actually, prototyping becomes really hard. And so this is where we, the, but where we came in with Algorithmia to really solve that problem. So Algorithmia is the first of its kind marketplace for algorithms. Algorithmia is a platform where algorithm developers can submit their code and anybody can benefit from their algorithms. And really how this works is developer has code, researcher has code, they can get push it into Algorithmia, they can use our online ID, they hit publish, it gets turned into a web service instantly. Not only does it get turned into a web service instantly, now it becomes part of this API, which every single other algorithm is also part of. So combining these algorithms becomes extremely easy. You can have in the public marketplace, the absolute expert in computer vision putting an algorithm to recognize something like 
if it's a pool or not in an image. And you can have the top researcher in a natural language processing putting in his text algorithms. And then if any third party developer can now come in and say, I'm gonna grab that best algorithm from that developer there, I'm gonna grab that best algorithm from that developer there, and I'm gonna put them together, combine them into whatever pipeline I am building out. And that's really becomes extremely easy to experiment with. So really, going back to the understanding of what humans are doing with this unstructured data, what we're really aiming to do with Algorithmia is bring under one roof the algorithmic knowledge of the world so every developer has access to it and we can use that as building blocks to better understanding. So for example, we have algorithms that allow you to grab audio and transform it into text. We have algorithms that allow you to look for uh, anomaly detection in a time series or look for spikes in a, in a time series. We have algorithms that allow you to grab an image and understand if there's something in that image, like an object that you're looking for or a skin tone that you're looking for. And when you combine these all under one, now you can start replicating how humans interpret the world but using machines at a much higher scale over pace. So some of the popular algorithms that are exist today in the marketplace, so in the world of text analysis, summarizers, sentence taggers, profanity detection, we have a bunch of machine learning algorithms, web crawlers, um, you know, audio and video detection algorithms, computation algorithms. So this is a small sample of over 1,800 algorithms that are made available today under the Algorithmia API. So really simply, how it works, you come with your algorithm, Java, Python, Scala, Node, C++. So a developer can put it into the system, hit submit. We actually deploy it into any cloud infrastructure in the world. And the reason why we do this is the founding principle behind us is that data is heavy and expensive to move. You don't want to move it. But compute is light and cheap to move. So we can actually move the compute to wherever the data is to process locally so that you don't have to worry about actually moving data between data centers. And finally, because it all becomes available through a REST API, it can be called from any platform, any language uh, that you want. So I'm gonna go through a couple of examples of the things that you can build once you have an API of algorithms available to you. So one of our more popular algorithms is actually a nudity detection algorithm. The reason why this existed uh, is what a company that was building software for schools needed to be able to moderate images that were going through the system. And actually doing manual moderation is extremely expensive, which most places do. If you think about how Facebook or Instagram actually does nudity detection today, what they will do is somebody has to report it. And so they do this like some social reporting of it and then they'll go in and moderate it manually. But we wanted to be able to do that algorithmically. And so what we found was well, there's a paper uh, from a university that we had been working with that said, if you can understand the skin tone, of the people inside uh, the image, then you can predict based on how much is exposed of that skin tone, if there's nudity or not. And so we already had in the marketplace a face detection algorithm. We had a nose detection algorithm, and then we had a skin color detection algorithm already built. Somebody had added those already. And so we got us thinking, well, well, we can combine those three things. Let's say we use the face detection to find the face. We use the nose detection to find the nose inside that face. And now we can grab a sample of that skin. So now we actually have the skin color for every single person that's in that image. And now based on that, we can look at how much of that skin is exposed throughout the entire image and give you a rating and saying, there is, this person might be naked, this person might not be naked, and return that so that you can do automated uh, uh, essentially like moderation. And then for anything that the confidence interval is low, you can send that to the manual moderation, reducing the cost of doing moderation by thousands and thousands of dollars. So facial recognition. So something that five to 10 years ago, we would have thought this is only from the movies, the future movies. This can be done simply through an API by just using a face recognition trainer, which is just an algorithm where you're giving it a data set and say, these people are this person, these pictures are all this person, and these pictures are not that person. And then grabbing that model and putting it under the underlying recognizer algorithm, we can actually do face detection. Any developer in this room can build facial detection into the application in less than 50 lines of code. I promise you that. And that's how easy it is to do. 
getting a little bit more complicated. So content is really, really big, uh, is a really big thing. And being able to do uh, you know, content recommendations. So usually when you go to a newspaper or a site or a media site, you'll see things like people who like this also like this. And it's done through something called collaborative filtering, which is really just fig figuring out the pairs of people and saying, okay, the people who clicked on this also clicked on that. And we said, you know what? I think we can do better. I think we can do better with the algorithms that already exist in the marketplace, that we can actually suggest content based on the actual content. And so what we meant to build, we built this thing called Algorithmia Recommends. So Algorithmia Recommends, you drop three lines of JavaScript on any site. And what it will do is the first time that site is loaded, it will phone home to Algorithmia, and we'll use an algorithm called Breadth First Sitemap, which will actually go and crawl that entire domain. It will crawl the entire domain looking for content, once it does that, it'll run it through the second algorithm called Analyze URL. This Analyze URL is a simple algorithm that all it does is it looks through the URL and says, is this, let's remove all the HTML tags, let's only keep the content, and return that. And if it's a PDF, return the text. If it's a Word document, return the text. The next one is we started getting a little bit more interesting. We went into the natural language processing algorithms. So for every single one of those pages, now we generate topic tags based on what content we found there. And finally, we analyze across the entire website to get rid of things that showed up everywhere. So for example, if I uh, you know, went to a newspaper site, a uh, Japanese newspaper, and I was generate, trying to gen generate content, the word Japan is not relevant because pretty much every article will probably contain that in that article. So you want to get rid of that. And so we were able to build a content recommender based on the actual content that you're seeing. Um, that will allow you to kind of make those suggestions purely based on the content. So going one more level of, of kind of application, this is we applied that same concept to doing content recommendations on video. And so in this particular case, and again, these are the different building blocks that you would need. So the first thing is give me a YouTube playlist. So we go to that YouTube playlist and we return all the other YouTube playlists from there. Once we get into that YouTube playlist, we download each one of the videos. The next step is to split the audio and the video. So now once we have the audio, what we can do is we can do speech to text. So now once we generate the text for each one of those videos, we can now apply the same natural language processing algorithms to understand what's being said in each one of these videos. And now once we understand what's being said in each one of these videos and we have tags for those, we can recommend content of what's actually being said in the video about other videos. So this is ignoring all meta tags that are uh, come with a video. This is actually doing content recommendations based on what is uh, being said in those videos. Um, and just to show you that it's not a gimmick, let me see if I can. It is an actual live demo, which can, you can see that it's actually going through the different YouTube videos. And it's actually based on the actual content, it's generating the recommendations that are being said in each one of those videos and showing the content that's related to that. So again, very, very easy to use and combine these algorithms. Um, I want to show, let's see here, you guys see, it's, this is what an algorithm looks like inside the Algorithmia Marketplace. So every algorithm will have a description of what it does. In this case, this one takes a URL, analyzes the URL, and it will return a bunch of labels associated with that URL. And so I can see what the description of that algorithm is, and I have a live input and output. So I can actually run this algorithm right now, and it will generate the, the tags. So I can already see what it would do without writing a single line of code. More importantly, once I figured out that this is what I want to use, all I need to do is select the language I want, copy paste that into my application, and I'm done. Now I can use any of these algorithms in the marketplace with my API key. All I need to do is just paste that directly into uh, my application in the language that I care about. So, sorry. So here's a really simple example of how it, uh, you know, of, how, of it working. So in this case, we have a summarizer, an input of about 5,500 words, and the output, what I want is it just to be eight words. And you can see that this entire thing was just done in uh, six lines of code. 
right? So they're using it. So all I need to do is the URL, which is I have it right there, the text, algorithm, yeah, algo, the algorithm I want to do it into it, pipe in the URL, grab that result, pipe it into the next URL algorithm, and I'm done. Now I've incorporated a summarizer into my uh, application. And I could do this all day with every single algorithm in the marketplace. I could just keep piping them into each other, into each other, into each other. So what does it look like? What is the future of algorithms? How will this trend continue? And what will the future tools look like that we're going to actually be using? And so again, I think the future is new data sources. It's really the ultimate frontier. Like what we're seeing today is that the unstructured data sources are outpacing the structured data sources by 10x. So by 2020, only about 20% of the world's data will actually be structured. And everything else will be this kind of video, images, tweets, uh, you know, kind of stream of conscious Facebook posts that are completely unstructured and need to be processed for us to be able to do stuff. Um, and so these, you know, because they're less structured, they're less amenable to traditional data interpretation without pre-processing. So as these algorithms become easier and easier to use, it only makes sense that the people who can actually use them, you know, are going to become less sophisticated. So today, any developer can use machine learning algorithms because of APIs like Algorithmias and other ones out there. But really, why can't somebody in an Excel spreadsheet directly be calling sentiment analysis or, or kicking off a deep learning job directly from their Excel spreadsheet? There's really no reason not to. This is where the tools are going, which is the simplification of bringing these algorithms available to every person on Earth so that they can actually use it. And this, by the way, is a real example. So we see the future as building blocks. We see the fact that you know the computer vision alg experts can bring their algorithmic expertise to the to, you know to, to the table. The natural language processing uh, people can bring theirs. Everybody bringing in, into uh, you know one marketplace. And by the way, we have a public version of the marketplace, or you can make a private version of the marketplace inside your corporation, so that every all the teams inside your company can actually share all their algorithms, and you can have the exact same effects. And really, our bet here is that. What you can build with the whole of these algorithms is much better than the individual components. So what we're betting on is that if we make all of these components easily to be combinable and accessible, you're going to be able to build applications way smarter than if with just these things by itself. So to leave you with the last couple of thoughts, so Algorithmia today is the leading solution for finding, sharing, and using state-of-the-art algorithms amongst complex teams with diverse technologies. We have over 15,000 developers already on the marketplace, over 1,800 algorithms that are available to you today that you can log into and start playing with. We've done over 18 million transactions, and we're available in over 86 different countries. Thank you very much uh, for having us, for having me. Um, so I want to give you like a code here, which is Rakuten Family. This gets you started for free on the Algorithmia platform. Um, you can log in with that code and start playing around with any of the algorithms completely for free. Uh, the documentation, and of course, just feel free to email me. Um, but thank you so much for having me. Uh, we're very honored to get invited to speak here today, especially since Rakuten is one of our investors. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Diego, for the wonderful presentation. We will now have um, Daryl presenting, and I'm sure you all have many questions to ask, but they are planning to have the question and answer session after Daryl finishes his presentation, so please reserve your questions till then. Thank you. I mean, I have to say, what Diego and team are doing is absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's just amazing. And uh, to give you, to give you uh, an example of, how just from his presentation, one of the, um, oh, that's my son. <laughs> uh, it's kind of cute, right? Um, just to give you an example, when he was referring to the face recognition algorithm, um, we're actually working right now with a consumer goods company that um, sells a lot of ice cream. And research shows that consumers, when going into a convenience store, um, are put off if they see that ice cream fridge to be dirty. Now, that's very difficult for a consumer goods company to try and capture that data and to manage those operations. So, but by crowdsourcing, by paying people using the convenience of their smartphone to take a photograph of a dirty fridge, we can then use 
your algorithms to be able to then automatically flag to that consumer goods company the location, yet yeah, the condition of that dirty fridge, which then they can then communicate to their retail partners. The opportunities are huge. And I think what I'm hoping to share with you today is to talk to you about, talk to you about um, a community and uh, called Dextra and a case study that we did with uh, Vicky, which is a subsidiary of Rakuten uh, in Singapore, and just demonstrate the power of the crowd in spurring data innovation. So the first thing I want to do, though, is share a little bit of data about myself. Um, I am an entrepreneur. I've been fortunate enough to uh, develop and build many different businesses. And today, I'm very much focused in the smart cities, active aging, civic innovation, and the open data space. Um, I play a lot of squash. I've been fortunate enough to live around the world in, in many different locations. But one little bit of uh, data that I'm happy to share with you is that I am actually more Neanderthal than the average, than the average human being. So if any of you are familiar with a service called 23andMe, is anybody familiar with 23andMe? Um, where you know, they'll actually analyze your, you know, your, your DNA. Um, I discovered that um, I, I'm more Neanderthal than the average European male. Um, I can also share a lot more about my personal data, but <laughs> we'll save that over the beer later. Um, the, the business that we've developed, um, DEX, is a data is everything service, and we have two platforms. The first platform is DEX.SG, and that is a data marketplace. Currently, we have over 250 organizations from the public, and more importantly, the private sector, so like the Unilevers, like the Prudentials, making data available. Now, the kind of data that you'll find in that marketplace, for example, would be the hospital bills of 10,000 customers, right? Documenting which hospital they went to, the condition, how long they spent there, the costs. Why would a company like a Prudential want to make this kind of data available? Well, they're deeply, deeply interested in understanding future trends in healthcare costs. And by making that data available, of course, anonymized, of course, masked in responsible ways, data scientists are picking that data up with other data sets in the marketplace and extracting incredible insights, being able to predict which hospitals are trending up in costs, being able to identify trends in certain lifestyle generated conditions, um, and that's really helps them with all their planning. But I'm going to focus more on Dextra, which is a community of 1,500 data scientists, predominantly based in Singapore, and the activities that they're doing in helping large organizations solve complex problems. So the screen that you see on the right is our platform, which is at Dextra.sg. If you're familiar with Kaggle, it has a lot of similar characteristics with Kaggle, where data scientists um, compete against each other to solve complex, sometimes simple, sometimes complex, data problems presented by sponsoring organizations. And the types of organizations that have sponsored this, Rackett and Vicky as one, are the companies like the Unilevers, the Prudentials. They're seeing value from doing so. But also, we've had government organizations like the Ministry of Defense in Singapore. Right. And what, is, what, is, what, it, what this is highlighting is that organizations are recognizing that they can't do everything within their own four walls. If they're going to be able to compete right, and, and progress, they need to find new ways to engage with the outside community. Now, that could be individual developers. That could be dynamic SMEs. Right? But by opening up data, finding new ways to share their data, their business challenges, you'd be amazed how dynamic and how active the crowd can be in getting involved. So let's, let's dig into what the, challenge, what the challenge was that was set by, by Vicky. Who's familiar with Vicky as a business? Okay, so Vicky is a global TV platform. It's a global TV website supported by a a manic community 
are contributors who will actually help translate um, for you know a Korean drama into English or Arabic and also they'll contribute comments to each of those individual scenes. This challenge was to under see if we could actually predict which three TV dramas each user watched on Viki in the months of February and March. To do this, what we, want, what we did was we provided four months worth of Viki user data between October through to January 2015. That data had who watched what and when and for how long. The data was from 800 users. We were able to have breakdowns around gender, country from which that user was. And also there was other content around the video attributes itself, the actors, the countries, etc. And from that data, from that data, the data scientists were being asked, can you predict what those users would watch in February and March? So the structure of the challenge was a kickoff, a five-week competition, right? And then from the participants, six were selected for a final um, presentations and one or two of the teams were then intended to be selected to continue the development of this model uh, for the business use of Vicky. To give you a sense of criteria, yes, we were, of course, accuracy um, of the prediction was really, really important, right? But so was also the engineering considerations. You know, how much would this cost to do? How quickly would it run? You know, how, how could it be extended elsewhere? And also we were looking for business and user insights because we, were, we clearly didn't give away all the detail of the data. We masked a lot of that data. We, we removed certain aspects to it. So there were always going to be some errors, but we were really trying to just see the thought process and what's the potential there. In total for this challenge, we had 132 participants. Now, if you think about this, if you're a team of five or six data scientists, by doing this, you've suddenly just grown your, your, your base of talent to 132, who have all volunteered to participate, who are excited because they've got access to data, right? And they love the idea of, of, of you know, competing. That's a very, very powerful creative energy for people to tap. Of those 32 participants, they actually formed teams. So they got to know each other and actually came together and built on the strengths of their individual contributions. So there was 30 teams. And in total, throughout the period of that competition, 567 entries were made. So we had some about, it's fair to say about 20% of the participants were very, very active, constantly posting, posting basically new submissions. And as I said, six were selected. Now, the winning team, which was called Team Reliant, were seven researchers from the Institute, uh, from ASTAR, and of the high performance computing team at ASTAR. If you're not familiar with Singapore, ASTAR is the 4,000, 5,000 strong government research agency. Now, for a business like Rakuten, it would have been very difficult for them ever to have got connected with that talent. Yet that talent decided to self-select themselves and compete on this challenge, right? And seven PhDs. Um, we then had people from Facebook and um, different, different professors from different universities competing. But they all also came up with very different approaches. So what it illustrated was that not one, one approach, there was not necessarily one solution to this, right? And it was just the variety of the responses and the suggestions, which was, again, really, really powerful and really, really free-flowing. So, you know, the second, second team, you know, use a preference vector with feature engineering for content-based recommendation. I mean, it was just different, different types of approaches. Also, another, another outcome, another benefit of doing this was for Rakuten, it reinforced its credentials right, within the innovation community, connecting and getting to know people, and also strengthens its bonds with the different government organizations. And I think it's fair to say that if we replicated this, say, in Paris, you'd get the same benefits from this, or in New York, or Boston, or elsewhere. 
It's very, 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 very positive. And you can see the feedback, you know, the personal feedback. This challenge was well specified with awesome me metadata. You know, it was just, it was just good interaction. And at the workshop, um, the workshop for the launch of the contest, you know, we had 80 to 100 people turn up, about a room like this, interested, wanting to learn. And that's just positive and great sharing. To give you a sense of the mix, to gain insights into the mix of talent, 25% of the people were from the universities. Um, 17 were technologists working in multinational companies, 15% were in startups, 11% in research institutes. Again, a really, really great mix of people that you would not necessarily always have the opportunity to interact with. Now, Rakuten co-owns the IP and it has exclusivity of this access to this IP for the next six months. And so it is working with this three-step algorithm from the A-star guys, and also looking at the interactive uh, data visualizations that, have, that were prevented by one of the other teams. So to summarize, you know, the positive outcomes were around collaboration, talent sourcing, and of course, a solution that was prototyped, and now can work towards bring, bringing that into the business and, and launching that. So the final thing that I want to share is you know, when we hear about smart cities, smart nations, there is a lot of great technology, but none of this is possible without open data, without government organizations, without private sector organizations seeing and believing the potential for them to open data and monetize that data. So I'm pleased to share that um, a week back, we announced in London a global data sharing partnership between the whole of London and the whole of Singapore. And what this means is that the data and beyond in terms of resolution and granularity that are in the government data sites is gonna be opened up further. We're gonna have 100 multinationals contributing data and startups into a massive synchronized data sandbox, synchronized by time, location, and device. Now with that kind of data, you can start to prototype smart city applications. Applications that you can develop in Singapore, and then of course, in London and beyond. Now, to give you an example of some of the data that's going in there, it's not just footfall data from telcos, it's also the shopping market, shopping basket data from supermarkets. So we can actually see if people are making bad food choices and eating their way to obesity, just as an example. But with that kind of data, the potential for innovation is huge. And this data sandbox will be open to the whole of the data community globally. So we're very hopeful that after a successful run for the next six months, cities like Tokyo will want to get involved. Los Angeles, Sydney's already expressed interest. And just as companies like Uber and Groupon built this data revolution, city by city, we, we want to be building this data re re revolution city by city. Um, so that's it. We're going we're gonna to do a few questions. Um, and uh, if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to ask. We're going to have a bit of a conversation between ourselves. Um, um, that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Trevor. So if you have questions, so please raise your hand, and I will pass the mic to you. Questions, anyone? Oh, oh, fantastic. Uh, I would like to ask about the uh, algorithm, yeah. And you, you said that um, people can upload the algorithm onto your system. So how can you make sure that the algorithm run exactly as is promised? Sure. So one of the things that we so so there's kind of two aspects to an algorithm running. Uh, one is making sure that the you know the actually it runs. So algorithms have to be able to compile uh, for them to be uh, you know uploaded into Algorithmia. The second one is really your what your question is how do you do exactly that's doing uh, what you want? And really is you have to try it. Uh, but what we do is we make it extremely easy for you to try it. And so that's why I showed that console where you can put in the input, you hit run, and you know the output. So you haven't written a single line of code. And so it's kind of like, how do you know when you download something from GitHub, 
if it's going to work or not. Yeah. And the question really is you don't. But you still now have to download it, compile it, get all the dependencies. And so we've gotten rid of that whole thing so that you can just send your data, mm -hmm. get it back, and be like, OK, this does what I think I thought it was going to be doing. Now I'm going to spend the time to call the API. I see. So uh, how about the uh, multiple like, algorithms that do the same thing? How, how can you like, rank it? So that's the, the user yeah. can choose. Yeah. So that's actually one of the best parts about our system, which is because it's just API calls. Mm -hmm. So what you do is now once you have the data preparation, you can make in parallel calls to every single. So let's say you have, which we, it, we actually do. We have nine different sentiment analysis uh, uh, algorithms that come from different libraries. How do you know which one works better for you? Well, the truth is, is that it depends on your data set. Mm -hmm. Like your data set is what's going to determine which one is better or not. So what you can do with algorithm is you can run your data set against all nine of them in parallel and then decide which one you're going to go with beyond that. And so like that's the thing where like if you wanted to do that with let's say downloading Stanford NLP and then Apache and like you would have to do manual process for each one of those libraries and then run it and get the results. Here you can do it in parallel in like very few lines of code. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I mean, so I'm going to ask you a question. Um, I mean, We've got all these great algorithms, got all these great technologies, I mean, but what is it that we can do to really drive the opening up of more data, right? And people to actually perceive, you know, th th there are fantastic opportunities in creating value for new applications and services. Sure, so I, th I think that, the, you know, the big, the big thing here is that, you know, when using, it used to take a expert in machine learning or an expert in algorithm development to work with any of these algorithms. And now it really is at the hand of any developer. So any developer that knows how to work with an API can start working with these algorithms. So, on the, so that's on the algorithm side. On the other side is this, the access to data. So now that you have, you know, if you really think, uh, which is true, which is data is the new oil, right? And then algorithms are the drill bits the pipe stations, the gas tankers. Uh, and so that combination is really where the power comes. Is any developer now has access to all these data sources across the world, and on top of that, to all these algorithms. So it really is, you know, that's really what, where the democratization comes in, which is it no longer takes a research team to do something where an iPhone, you know, if you're just an iPhone developer, uh, you can still have access to the exact same computing power that a research team does. Any other questions? Oh, I've got one hand. Oh, oh. Sorry. Uh, I have a small question about the algorithm here. Yeah? That's uh, about the algorithm. Is this uh, customizable or is uh, use that it, it is or? So the, the answer is depends. So the, the question was, are the algorithms customizable? And so there's a couple of different answers to that. There's one which is some algorithms take in different parameters and those parameters you can just feed it different parameters and like customize it in that way. Um, some algorithms are completely black box. That's actually up to the algorithm developer to decide. So we don't make that decision. You as the algorithm developer decide, I'm gonna make it a black box algorithm, which means the source code is not viewable, or I can make it uh, you know, the source code viewable. We're adding features now which will allow you to actually clone the ones that where the source code is, is viewable as well. So you'll be able to clone it privately and then modify it yourself to do exactly what you wanted. But what we really found was these algorithms, if you go down to like its most atomic molecular level, like you get these algorithms that do one thing like really, really well, really just allowing parameters to be customizable is enough. Because then developers can build around whatever customization they need in terms of pre-processing or post-processing of the data. Okay, so that may be a comment because, uh, for example, if, if the uh, algorithm is uh, customizable, it's some kind of like open sourcing, uh, people can join and improve the algorithm and make some kind of community. And I think it is a very uh, good opportunity for the user also. Yes, thank you. We've got a question, question in the back. Yeah. yeah. So about reliability of algorithm. So for ensuring reliability, um, I just think like uh, giving a way to uh, specify the specification, uh, it's maybe important. Like, you know, algorithm is kind of fundamental thing of a program. Fundamental thing is if it goes wrong, then it has a huge impact. So just for like, I mean, giving some testing mechanism, like giving some sample input and, and some expected output and just matching those things doesn't actually ensure the whole thing. So something formal verification is kind of important. And 
for some basic algorithm in the papers, people used to provide the soundness. But for a larger algorithm, I mean, when it's a commercial and for more complex task, it's very difficult. So do you have some idea, I mean, do you have some I mean, intention to provide a, a way to specify the specification in a simpler way and so that it can be mesh, I mean, verified in machine or with some human effort together with machine? Yeah. I mean, do you have any uh, intention or any idea about that? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so this is around like verification of algorithms. So so we see uh, you know verification of algorithms kind of in in two parts. Again, there is a reliability in terms of scale, um, and there's reliability in terms of resource consumption. And so these are things that we we provide and help with. So we can actually say based on this data set when we ran this algorithm, this is how much memory pressure it put on the system, this is how much processing power it took on the system. Uh, we can say how long it took to process a given data set and stuff like that. And so this is all information that can be used uh, you know, to kind of do that type of verification. In terms of error reduction, which is the other uh, side of it, it really comes down to like the owner of the data set is really the only person who's gonna understand what the what the error is? There's no you know we can provide a lot of inputs into kind of using machine learning to redu reduction of that error, but it really comes down to the owner of of, of, of the data set that runs it and is going to really intuitively. If you think about how data scientists explore a data space, they have an intuition in towards this doesn't look right or this does look right, um, and that really continues to be the case. What we're, well, algorithm really becomes strong in is that the fact that once you have an algorithm and you publish it, let's say inside an organization, you know, the fact that like this can, the system can scale it by itself, it can actually tell you, okay, the memory pressure is high, like we need to, you know, put more machines behind it and stuff like that is really what kind of reduces the risk of using uh, algorithms that you didn't develop yourself. So hopefully that this answers the question. Can I, can I just ask one quick question? How many, how many people in the room have frequently gone to hackathons or participated in data innovation challenges? One, two, three. Okay. Um, for somebody that, for, and then how many people in the room actually sit on a lot of data? So you're actually, you, you are data owners and you're working with a lot of data. And how many, of, how many people in the room sit on a lot of data? Okay, and then how often do you go and source additional data sets from outside? How much of a challenge is that for you? It's huge, right. Do you mind, do you mind just explaining some of the challenges? Um, do you want to, Mike? Okay. <laughs> okay, all right, that's fine. So there was a question just here. Well, uh, actually, I have a couple of questions for basically both. So first, uh, not a question, just a concern. I hope in future, kind of your two platforms will be a threat for e AI because they will be able to explore so much. <laughs> but going out, out, uh, out of that, uh, for example, you said about black boxing some algorithm. Uh, let's say I have a, I build an algorithm. Can I publish this on my cloud and just make you as a hub for people to get to my algorithm without opening it to you? Uh, uh, that's one point. Second point is on both uh, sides. Uh, can we have an idea, for example, if, uh, if it's not only for uh, big companies, if it's something for developers, how low or not is cost on use of algorithm or use of data? So I think from on the cost side, um, access to the data and the data exchange is actually free, um, up to 10,000 calls to the API. So as a developer, you can get free access. There, is, there will be some restrictions in, to the resolution of that data, um, but you can get free access to rapidly prototype and develop your applications. Also, to participate in these challenges, which are creating use cases and demonstration of the value that can come from when this data is open. To the participants, again, that is free, right? Um, and when we speak to a lot of the participants, the reasons for them getting involved 
is for personal development. They're getting great access to data. They're meeting and learning and interacting with a lot of new people. Plus, they're getting exposure to some great companies. And I think, you know, as a close off on my side, the Rakuten Institute of Technology team that supported this challenge were amazing in their accessibility and support. Um, and that's why you got such positive feedback from the community. Um, so regarding the, the, the black boxing of, of algorithms, so one of the pieces that I said is that, you know, we, we take compute to the data, right? And the only way we can do that is if we compile the code on our side. What we have done, though, is we've done a lot of stuff around security and IP restrictions. So, for example, like that code is, only, is not really visible to anybody. It gets compiled and gets stored compiled already on our Git repository, so we don't actually have like, access to the source code anymore. Um, the second piece is, you know, if you're in a private organization, you have a full-blown marketplace. We can deploy algorithmia privately inside the data center that has no communication with the outside world. So you different organization, different teams inside the same organization can share their algorithms, can import from the cloud what ones if they want to, uh, like the ones that are, they can license those in. But more importantly, like none of the data or the algorithmic IP ever leaves that, that private cloud. So that's how we, we, we get around that. Um, and regarding to your, your, your thing about AI, so there's two things, that, and I'll kind of close out with that, which is one, we, you know, we see you know, an algorithm solves a problem. One algorithm solves one problem really, really well. Multiple algorithms that can work together become problem-solving algorithms. So now you have a library that can solve problems. And that is essentially one way of looking at how our brain works, right? Like we are a deduction machine. We solve problems by taking different inputs and kind of putting those together. Regards being scared around the AI. So there's, there's a phrase that I really like using, which is, you know, uh, we, everybody's worried that, uh, you know, computers are going to take over the world. They're, they're going to get too smart and they're going to take over the world. And I would say that I'm actually worried that computers already took over the world and they're still too dumb. And so, you know, like that's actually where the real problem is. Like AI is so far behind, you know, what humans can do. This is only an accessory to us. Like this whole fear mongering around like where AI is going, like it's, they can only be there to help us get better. You know, they're gonna take away tasks that humans are just bad at na naturally and help us be able to concentrate on things that we're good at. Thank you very much for your time. I think we're out here, so. Great, thank you. Thank you everyone. So yes, we are running out of time and this will be the end of the session. Thank you very much, Mr. Daryl and Mr. Diego for the opportunity to know you and sharing the knowledge with us. Thank you very much. Hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you.